Hello everyone and welcome back. Is marriage on the way out? Is adultery still wrong? Is the institution of the home with its family life to disappear from society? How and when did the institution of marriage even originate? Does it really serve any purpose today? On today's program, we're going to look at the God-ordained institution of marriage. According to the Office of National Statistics here in the UK, about 2.5 million people between the ages of 45 and 64 live in their own home alone. Now that number has grown by about 50% just in the past 20 years. As columnist Melanie Phillips wrote a few years ago, she said Britain appears to be turning into a disunited kingdom of solitary and lonely people. Look at the breakdown in this society, just here in the UK. I mean, one in three children in the UK have no access to their biological fathers. That amounts to four million children. I mean, the family is breaking down all around us. Whether it's marriage or children or the relationship between children and parents, Let's look at some very, very basic scriptures today. Please go and get your Bible and read along. We're going to start today in Genesis chapter 1. And I, as you get your Bible, I just want to refer you to this wonderful and inspiring and hopeful little booklet titled, Why Marriage Soon Obsolete? That's the question that Herbert W. Armstrong asked back in the 1960s. And he, writing way ahead of his time, talked about some of the problems that we see that are so pervasive today all across society. He said right at the outset of this book, by the way, that some psychologists taking a new look at the institution of marriage are voicing shocking predictions for the near future. He said, indeed, in their professional eyes, the trend toward obsolescence of the marriage custom has already started and is gaining momentum. Astonishing? Yes, indeed. But marriages are not only breaking down all around us, the very usefulness and desirability of the custom is being seriously questioned. People are seriously questioning if they even want to get married. Many people don't. Many children are born out of wedlock. Many children, as I said from uh, that uh, survey just a, a bit ago, have no access to their biological father. And even if the family is somewhat intact, how many people even understand the very first part of this question? Why marriage? Why is there such an institution as marriage? Where and how did it originate? Who started it? Who came up with it first? Those questions are addressed in this wonderful little booklet you can obtain your free copy today by just texting us your information, your name and address, to 80800. It's as simple as that. You're probably pretty close to your phone right now. Just text us your name and, and address, and we'll send you a free copy of this wonderful little booklet. You can also call the number on your screen. It's also very easy to do it at our website, thetrumpet.co.uk. You can go in there and just basically type in your postcode and then search for your address and send in your request to this beautiful booklet, a wonderful read. Along with it, we'd like to give you a free subscription to our Trumpet magazine. You can see a familiar family on this particular issue from a few months ago. But this too, we will send this to your mailbox free of charge so that you can understand the world that you're living in. Of course, there's lots of, of articles in this magazine that have to do with prophecy and current events. But there's also uh, quite a few Christian living topics that will encourage you to pattern your life, your marriage, your family after the family in heaven. Please, uh, again, stay tuned. Uh, and later, we'll give you all that information again so that you can request 
your free copy today. As I said, we're going to start in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, and beginning in verse 26, where it says, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the, the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. God, God said, Let us. There was more than one. God and the Word, as John 1 and verse 1 brings out. God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. You can read the verses that precede this one. 25 verses that talk about all the other uh, five days of creation, the five creation days before this one. And then here, God slows it way down and gives us so much information about the formation of man. He gives us so much information about their special environment, the specific roles and responsibilities that they each had as man and woman. And he institutes the marriage and the family relationship. As you can read just from these first two chapters of your Bible, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, really, once God slows it down after the creation of man, it becomes a subject that's all about marriage and family. Look at what he says in verse 27. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them, both male and female, made in the image of God. And so right at the outset, God creates this, this sex system in both the male and the female, very different, and yet the two fit together as a perfect complement to one another. Both of them fearfully and wonderfully made, as it says in Psalm 139. God created sex. God created marriage. And so it follows that we should look to God for answers to questions like, why marriage? Why should there be marriage? Why reproduction? Why family? Why, why children? Why parents? Why did God make us? What is this for? As I said, Mr. Armstrong really does address these all-important questions in this beautiful booklet. Why marriage? Soon obsolete? I mean, you look around at society today, and it is becoming obsolete. It isn't necessary, so many people think. It's not worth getting into because, well, if you do, then there's going to be divorce. You're going to be tied down. You're going to be unhappy. Why not go it alone? That's the message that, that Satan is just pummeling this society with. Why bother? Let's look at Matthew chapter 19. We'll switch over to the Gospels and see here what Jesus Christ said about this subject. Matthew chapter 19, and we'll start in verse 1. We'll go back to Genesis here in, uh, in just a minute. But firstly, look at chapter 19, verse 1. And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and came into the coast of Judea beyond Jordan, and great multitudes followed him, and, uh, and, he, and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came to him, this is verse 3, tempting him and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? So here's a, one of many examples where the Pharisees were just trying to trip him up, trying to trick him, probably referring back to Deuteronomy 24, or that was what they were thinking, Deuteronomy 24 and verse 1, where Moses wrote about the bill of divorcement. But notice how Jesus responds to these who were just trying to reason around God's law, God's teaching, God's truth. Jesus takes them right back to the beginning, Notice yourself what he says, verse 4, And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? Haven't you read this? It's right there in Genesis 1 after all. Haven't you studied this subject? Don't you know that God created sex? God created the two, the two sex systems? And why? For what reason? Verse 5, he says, And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, 
and shall cleave to his wife, and they two shall be one flesh. Here again, he's quoting from Genesis, Genesis 2 this time, and we'll get to that in just a second. But he says, haven't you read this from the beginning? He says, for this cause, because God created sex, in other words, for this cause, then, well, a man should leave his father and cleave to his wife. In other words, because he created sex, God ordained the marriage institution. God made them. From the beginning, he made them male and female so that they could be married. So that they could be married to one another. This is really how we're, we're made in the image of God. It's through marriage, through family. Verse 6 says, Wherefore they are no more two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together... Let not man put asunder, see these two, through marriage, become one. It's God who, not some man, it's God who joins the husband and the wife together as one. It's human beings who tear apart, who divide he goes on and talks to these Pharisees saying it was Moses who wrote about that bill of divorcement because of the hardness of your heart. It was because the Israelites, the ancient Israelites, without the Spirit of God, were so carnal and hard-hearted, so stubborn and so unable to get along that Moses allowed for that separation. But from the beginning, it was not so. God didn't make them male and female so that they could marry and then split apart or commit adultery or destroy the family or see the family and the children break down. He made marriage to help us understand His divine purpose for man. What a lesson there is in marriage and family. If it's based on the sure laws of God, if it's based on that solid spiritual foundation, Let's go back then to Genesis. As I said, Christ was there quoting from Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. I mean, do you think Jesus Christ subscribed to the, the common thinking today, even within theological circles, that, oh, the book of Genesis is just, uh, it's a big myth, a bunch of exaggerations, some, some stories, yes, but, but they didn't really happen. Did Christ believe that? Well, read Matthew 19 again after this program is over. He believed that the book of Genesis was inspired. He believed it was the truth of God. And so should you. Never mind what scholars or educators might say today, those that are skeptics, those that want to reject the truth of God, those that want to say, well, it doesn't really apply to today. It didn't really happen. God can't perform miracles. These aren't laws of God. Well, okay, if it didn't start with God, marriage that is, then where did it start? Who came up with it and why? Why would they? You don't see it anywhere else. You don't see it in the animal kingdom. And scientists would, would tell you that we're supposed to come from animals. So at which point along the evolutionary train did marriage start? That's what Mr. Armstrong asks in this booklet. Who started it and why? Because if you believe God, if you believe God is creator, then you go right back to Genesis 1 and you know. Haven't you read, Jesus said? Haven't you studied this, you Pharisees? Don't you know what God intended from the very beginning? Genesis chapter 2 now in verse 7. It says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And then down in verse 18, it says, And the Lord God said, It's not good that the man should be alone. I will make an help meet for him. It's not good that he should be alone. He needs a helper. He needs a complement. And so does she, by the way. The two need each other. The two can't have a family. They can't have children unless they come together as one. This is some pretty deep instruction. It's right here in the very first couple of chapters in the book of Genesis, verse 23. Notice this. It says, And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. 
she shall be called woman because she was taken out of the man. You look into the Hebrew meaning or the Hebrew words, ish for man and isha for woman. She came right out from the man and the two come together as one through marriage. The next verse, verse 24, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, this is what Christ quoted, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. For this reason, that's what Jesus said in Matthew 19. Here, Moses was inspired to write, Therefore, because there's man and woman, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and these two should be one flesh. When we come back from the break, we'll talk more about what others in the Bible wrote. The Apostle Paul, for example, and some other passages in the New Testament, where over and over again you see this same theme reemerge: Marriage, family, father, children, parents. It all goes back to what God had in mind from the very beginning. Your study really should begin with this subject. Marriage, and this little booklet, Why Marriage, Soon Obsolete. Make sure you stay tuned. Get all the information that you need so that you can request your free copy of this fantastic booklet today. Is marriage on the way out? Is the institution of the home with its family life to disappear from society? How and when did the institution of marriage originate? Does it, after all, serve any necessary purpose? Why Marriage, Soon Obsolete, takes an in-depth look at the institutions of marriage, the home and family life, and reveals a startling, even shocking truth which has been altogether overlooked by science, by religion, by education, and by society. To learn more, please visit thetrumpet.com. I'd like for you to think about the, the many passages that we're, we're reading here today, right from your own Bible, and, and think about why there's so much in the Bible. Why does God have so much to say about marriage, about family, uh, about reproduction, about parents and children, the relationship that we have with one another? Well, the reason for all of this is because God's relationship with man is a family relationship. It's really, it should be anyway. It should be obvious. And yet this truth is so misunderstood, even in the world of religion. God is carrying out His purpose for man through marriage and family. So that's why from beginning to end, from Genesis to Revelation, that's why God has so much to say about marriage and family. We'll get to the book of Revelation here in just a minute. We've already talked about what God revealed in the book of Genesis, what Jesus Christ quoted in Matthew 19. Let's look now at what the Apostle Paul said in, uh, in what we often call the marriage chapter. This is Ephesians chapter 5. We'll start in Ephesians 5, beginning in verse 25. Husbands, it says, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. I mean, even as Christ, that's who we look to as husbands. Love your wives the way that Jesus Christ loves the church. And verse 27, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. I mean, if you look, like I say, if you look at these scriptures, you, you think it would be obvious that God's relationship with man is a family relationship. God himself's called a father. Jesus is his son. He's going to marry the church. Here we're talking about marriage uh, in a physical union and how that we model it after the relationship between Christ and the church. Let me take you to a quote. This is from the, the free booklet offer today from Why Marriage, Soon Obsolete. Mr. Armstrong asks on that cover, this is from page 18. He says, Were it not for the very fact that we were created in God's very likeness with the very purpose of being born of God, 
born into God's own family, the marriage institution giving us the experience of family life would never have been ordained. If we were mere animals developed by evolution, marriage would never have existed. As I said, I mean, where did it start along the evolutionary chain if that's how we came into existence? It started when God created man. God is creator. God ordained marriage and family. These are god plain relationships. Now, because of what we're studying here, you can see why there's such a massive breakdown in society today. Because Satan hates marriage and family. He knows what it's there for. He knows what it points to. He knows how, if done right, it prepares us for our future. And so he's attacking it from every direction. Staying here in Ephesians uh, 5, verse 29, it says, For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, even as the Lord the church. Here again, there's the comparison we make. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Notice what Paul says there. He's talking about the marriage, or rather Christ and the relationship he has with the church and the coming marriage. And he says, for this cause, because of that coming marriage between Christ and the church, because of that, then two are married in the physical realm. Two come together, as Mr. Armstrong brings out in that quote we just read. Were it not for the, the coming marriage between Christ and the church, there'd be no such thing as marriage. God wouldn't have instituted it from the very beginning. Verse 32, he says, This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. You see, it's been a great mystery from the very beginning. People don't understand why marriage. It's a great mystery. But what Paul, what's Paul really getting at here? What's he really talking about here? Well, he's talking about Christ and the church. God's relationship with man is a family relationship. He's talking about Christ and the church. His relationship with man is a family relationship, and it starts with the marriage between Christ and the church. And then you go on from there, and you see all the, the ultimately the billions of children that come into the family of God as a result. This is uh, not the booklet, but another quote from Mr. Armstrong, who said in 1974, Why did God give to humans this god plain relationship given to no other creature? Because this life is the training ground for our life in God's kingdom to prepare us for that eternal life. He says God's law of marriage was designed to impress us with the sacredness and the permanency of marriage. Two of God's Ten Commandments protect the permanency of that sacred and holy union. I mean, it's right there within the, the very commandments that we're to keep as Christians. There's a command that, that children should honor their parents. I mean, it's all, it, it all revolves around family. It all revolves around this, this sacred and permanent union. As Mr. Armstrong says there, let's just look at one last passage. This is the book of Revelation now. We come near to the end of the book, Revelation chapter 19. And we'll start in verse 6. Revelation 19 and verse 6, it says, And I heard, as it were, the, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, say, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us, verse 7, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to Him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and His wife has made herself ready. Let's, I mean, this is something to rejoice about. This husband and wife relationship, this oncoming marriage between Christ and the church, this is something that ought to really get us excited about our future. This coming marriage, this is something, as Paul said in Ephesians um, 5, that we're to pattern our own marriages after, verse 9, it says here, And he says uh, unto me, right, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb, and he said unto me, These are the true sayings of God. One final quote here from Mr. Armstrong's wonderful little booklet here on marriage. 
He says, man's potential, the purpose for human life on this earth is to be born into the kingdom of God, the God family of all life forms, whether plant, animal, or angel. None has been given this God plane relationship of marriage and family life except humans who are potential heirs of God's family. Only human beings have this relationship. Only human beings have this marriage and family relationship. Why? Well, it strikes at the heart of why we're made in the first place, why we're here on this earth, what God is preparing us for. Make sure, if you haven't gotten the information, that you write it down and send in your request for this free booklet. It's free of charge. There's no cost or no obligation. We'd like to send it out to you today. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you again next time.